Uh, joining us now live is the Justice Secretary, Dominic Raab. Good morning, Mr Raab. How are you? Good morning. Uh, good to be with you. Yeah. Well, you've had a weekend, as we all have, to reflect on all of this. What are your, what are your initial conclusions this morning? What, are you, what would you say differently now that you wouldn't have said maybe 24 hours ago? I'm not sure that I've got anything definitive in that regard. We're all still reeling. I knew Sir David very well. Um, we'd worked together on animal welfare campaign issues and uh, we're feeling his loss. And I think you'll feel a lot of that heartfelt tribute uh, in the House of Commons from all sides of the chamber. I think in terms of your question, your challenge of what do we do differently, um, I think we've got to look at, I listened to what um, Tulip was saying, I think we've got to look at uh, and listen to the concerns and the fears that MPs right around the country have. We know that local forces were in, have been in touch over the weekend with every MP. Um, uh, I spoke to mine. Uh, and we're going to think about all the, do our due diligence, if you like, what are the practical steps we take to keep us safe so that we've got the confidence to do our job. I, I think the, the, the other thing we're all very mindful of is not allowing a wedge to be placed between us and the constituents and the communities we serve. We just got to get that balance right. Uh, we certainly don't want to give uh, the terrorists or anyone else, frankly, for that matter, the gift of, of undermining or corroding our democracy. So it's difficult. It's a difficult balancing act. I mean, we've, this, and this is not, um, although the, the, the death of Sir David is harrowing, heartbreaking, and my heart goes out to Julia and his family, we, we've had a case like this before. We've had other cases like this before. And we've seen this steady coarsening of political debate, certainly since I've been an MP since 2010. So I think it's right, uh, and in fact, frankly, the, the words of the family uh, about kind and generosity of spirit, all things that Sir David typified, I think we all need to have a, a good long think uh, and reflect. And as, as Lorraine was saying, turn that spirit, if you like, that bottle of emotion into actually practically how we go forward. Um, because our politics has become more divisive, more polarised, more coarse, and that's led to some of the abuse that we've seen and indeed creates a climate within which uh, I think you do see more intimidation, harassment uh, and threats to MPs. Yeah, yeah. and we've, we've even seen that this morning with the news that a man's been arrested in connection with the death threat made to uh, the Labour MP Chris Bryant in the wake of Chris Bryant calling for more kindness in the wake of Sir David Amos's death. I mean, there will be people who will just ignore that call for kindness. And I, you know, listening to Tulip and listening to Lisa Cameron, this isn't just something that affects MPs, it's something that affects their families as well. What reassurance can you give to MPs that you're going to provide them with protection at a particularly vulnerable moment? Yeah, Suzanne, I think it's a really important point. And can I just also say, from my own experience talking to female colleagues uh, that have come off, for example, Twitter because of the abuse they get, I think the abuse, the, the risk, the threat, the vilification against women is particularly uh, uh, worse and particularly um, vile. Um, what, what are we going to do about it? So, first of all, as I mentioned, uh, police forces across the country have been in touch with their local MPs just to provide some practical measures and reassurance. There's going to be a review, the Home Secretary has said that, to look at how we spread best practice. Tulip was talking about uh, it being patchy or the postcode um, lottery. We want to make sure there's more consistency of best practice. Uh, there's also the issue um, around um, the online uh, abuse that we see all too frequently. We already have the online harms bill going through what's called pre-legislative scrutiny. We'll look at all of the issues around that. I know people have been asking about the anonymity of uh, those that, that engage in this vilification, this vile abuse online. That's something I think we need to look at. Uh, but throughout all of this, uh, we ought to take a proportionate approach. Uh, we, we can't just pretend it's business as usual, but equally, we can't let the terrorists or those who want to disrupt our democracy dr drive that wedge between us and our constituents no. and our communities. Um, and, I, and I think that's something that a lot of us will feel very strongly about. One of, one of the government's main planks um, against the inception of terrorism and following on into actual acts of terrorism has been PREVENT, uh, which is this de-radicalisation unit, which takes mostly young men um, who seem to be drifting into a radicalised frame of mind. They're put forward, they go to prevent, and they're supposed to be de-radicalised. De and there are clearly cases where it works, but clearly there are cases, Fishmongers Hall, what appears to have happened on Friday, where it absolutely hasn't worked. And one, one metaphor that was, that was uh, given by one of our viewers today was that it's a bit like driving a car, where you think the brakes might work one minute and they don't work the next. Do you think we need a, a root and branch approach to the way we try and de-radicalise these mostly young men away from this fundamentalist zealotry? 
So, th look, I, first of all, I think it, it's a huge challenge. At the moment, the way Prevent works is there's a triage system, if you like, up to what's called the channel panels, which allow those who are regarded as a particular risk to be assessed and for measures and action to be taken proportionate to that risk by all the local stakeholders, whether the contact has been with a school, with uh, another local agency, uh, but also connecting it with the police and uh, the security services. So that's really important. There is more broadly a review going on about the efficacy of PREVENT. But I think we need to bear in mind that there is no foolproof uh, set of precautions that we can take in relation to the lone wolf attacker. What we can do is build up the checks, the balances, the mitigations, the flags, the warning signs. Um, I don't think that any country is better served by their intelligence agencies or uh, police forces than we are in the UK, but that doesn't mean that we don't constantly look to do better. And we also just need to bear in mind, it's at the back of our minds, that one of the aims of those who attack us, certainly in the name of terrorism, but, but, but others as well, um, that they're trying to uh, uh, build up the walls around politicians, uh, stop them from doing their job, and there's a more surreptitious attack on the way our democracy works. So I think we need to be proportionate. Um, okay. But look, we keep all of our measures, including Prevent, under constant okay. review. Prevent is itself now uh, under review, yep. and, and the Home Secretary's looking at it very carefully. Okay, Mr. Rob, um, we spoke to um, an expert on radicalisation a little bit earlier who said that they were very concerned about what might have happened happened during lockdown, uh, people isolated on their own, being fed too much poison um, via social media and, and dark places on the web. It, is it something that you are considering at Prevent, possibly, going back over people who might have been referred to the programme, um, reviewing mm -hmm. who has been previously referred to Prevent and, you know, finding out if lockdown and, and uh, that isolation might have contributed to further radicalisation. Checking them out. Look, in terms of the operational matters, I, I'm not going to comment on, on those. But what I would say is that, that there is no doubt in my mind, intuitively, but I think also um, uh, what we can ascertain as a matter of fact, that lockdown with people cocooned in their homes, um, with the amount of time being spent online, um, uh, for, for, there, there was, for some people, they said, well, actually, they spent more time with their family, remote working has worked for them. There, there are some bits of that technology, that online presence that were positive, but there is also a darker side to it for those who are vulnerable, for those who are at risk of radicalisation, for those with mental health issues. Uh, and I think that we are very clear that the risk uh, has evolved online as a result of the pandemic and lockdown, and I'm very confident that the police and the intelligence agencies are adapting and adjusting to what that okay. looked like. And, and that also highlights how important it was uh, to come out based on the vaccine into a more normal way of, yes. uh, of living. All right, um, briefly, as you can imagine, our, our viewers, and I'm sure this is true in society in general today, are fizzing with ideas to help. They are, they are coming up with all sorts of innovations and thoughts and suggestions. An increasingly common one, and I've not seen this discussed much, if at all, in the Sunday newspapers, is the issuing of stab-proof vests to MPs, that MPs, when they have a surgery, slip on a stab-proof vest when they're going to some kind of public function, where they're interrelating with their constituency, they wear a stab-proof vest. What's your initial reaction to that suggestion? Well, um, I'm happy to look at any practical measures, but the reality is that people were threatening you with something else. Um, uh, the most recent threat I've had was someone threatening to throw acid uh, over me. So I, I, I'm, I'm all up for these ideas, and we need to look at and think about them very carefully. But we, you know, you come back to the, the stab vest won't be a foolproof um, response, and uh, people have to think about the risk that they face and how confident uh, they feel about it. I do think there is something about the confidence that we as MPs feel. People will feel differently about this kind of question. Um, so it's about the individual, what they feel they need to do their job and what they feel they need to confidently do their job. Because, as I say, the crucial thing for all of us, doesn't matter what your politics are, to stay connected with your community and your constituents. Was someone prosecuted for that threat? Well, I'm not going to talk about it, it, uh, the details of any more, but there was clearly an intervention in relation to it. But I just, I just give it to you as an example where um, we, you know, over the last 11 years, we've just seen um, uh, the trickle effect from the growing abuse uh, trip into other things of a far more 
uh, significant uh, and dangerous and direct nature. I mean, that was very recently. Um, so, uh, and but I will not be deterred from doing my job. Uh, I think if you're a minister, particularly in the cabinet, you face probably a different level of, of threat because of your profile. But on the other hand, you get more uh, support, protection, yeah, more support. Yeah. and I and I do feel for junior ministers and backbenchers, particularly in their constituency, because they will feel vulnerable. That's why the police are contacting them. We're going to look at this across the board um, and, and make sure that. MPs have got the uh, the support and the confidence to do their job. Well, you have our best wishes in that endeavour. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you.